welcome to the Atlanta Bariatric Center at Emory Johns Creek Hospital. This short presentation will cover the variety of surgical options available for weight loss. We'll explain many things in this presentation as we want you to be as fully informed as possible. We'll start by talking about surgical weight loss options, including the three main types of procedures performed here at Emory Johns Creek. We'll also explain the preparation required before surgery, what happens to your body during surgery, and what you and your bariatric team need to do in the post-operative recovery process. Most importantly, we'll talk about the rationale for bariatric surgery. Following this presentation, we will introduce one of our bariatric surgeons to answer any questions you have. Feel free to write down any questions you may have for this Q&A period. We perform a variety of weight loss or bariatric sur surgeries here at Emory Johns Creek. Even so, surgery isn't for everyone. You and your surgeon will work together to determine whether you are a surgical candidate, and if so, which bariatric procedure is best for you. A recurring theme you will hear throughout this presentation, and one that needs to be at the forefront of your decision-making process, is what commitment am I willing to make? Our surgeons can do a technically perfect operation, and you are not going to lose the weight you want to lose and get as healthy as you could be unless you hold up your end of the deal. In a few moments, we'll talk about what those commitments entail and the lifestyle changes you will need to make. You need to ask yourself if you are ready to make those necessary changes. We are in the midst of an obesity epidemic. Currently, three in five Americans are obese or overweight, and as this series of maps from the Centers for Disease Control demonstrate, it appears that things are only going to get worse. The first image is a map from 1985. It uses red and blue to show the percentage of people in each state that are overweight or obese. As we move forward in time, the colors change to show the growth in obesity rates during the last 20 plus years. You can see that the percentage of the population who suffers from obesity continues to grow until the charts incorporate new colors and new categories. You may now be asking yourself, so why should I lose weight? Everyone is becoming obese, so I'll fit right in. Unfortunately, an obese individual's risk of dying early is doubled compared to someone of ideal body weight. This is because of the many other health problems that are associated with obesity. Here, we see a list of the most common obesity-related comorbidities. Comorbidities are those health problems that often go along with being overweight or obese. Some of them may look familiar to you, as you already have them or are on your way to getting them. The best thing about losing weight with surgery is that many of these problems get better. Some may even go away completely. Weight loss can also help reduce your risk of getting some of these diseases in the first place especially diabetes, high blood pressure, and some types of cancer. Unfortunately, obese individuals have a much higher chance of dying from certain cancers, particularly colon, prostate, and breast cancers. For obese men, the cancer mortality rate is 52% higher than normal weight individuals. For women, the rate is 62% higher. In addition, 70% of diabetes in the U.S. is due to obesity. Odds are a fair number of you already have type 2 diabetes or are on your way to getting there. Bariatric surgery can help you. In fact, weight loss surgery can be a great preventative health care tool. Our surgeons at the Atlanta Bariatric Center think this is the greatest benefit of surgical weight loss. Now we're going to discuss how to determine obesity. Body mass index, or BMI, is the ratio of your height to your weight. The larger the number is, the higher the BMI. Your BMI is one of the primary factors for determining obesity and whether you qualify for bariatric surgery. Here at Emory Johns Creek, we follow the American Society of Bariatric Surgeons guidelines, which state that a patient may be eligible for bariatric surgery if they have a BMI greater than 40 or a BMI greater than 35 if they have comorbidities such as high blood pressure, sleep apnea, or diabetes. An ideal BMI is typically less than 25. An individual may be considered overweight if their BMI is between 25 and 30. An individual is considered obese once their BMI goes over 30. 
At a BMI of 35, a person is considered severely obese and could be a surgery candidate. When an individual reaches a BMI of 40, they are considered morbidly obese and would most likely qualify for bariatric surgery. This chart illustrates the relationship between BMI and mortality. An individual's risk of dying greatly increases with a BMI over 35 and significantly jumps when the BMI gets over 40. This is a primary rationale for why we do bariatric surgery. The risk of dying early from comorbidity-related diseases greatly outweighs any of the risks posed by surgery. Bariatric surgery can be an effective means for losing weight when other methods, such as diet and exercise alone, have been unsuccessful. In fact, you have probably tried losing weight through diet and exercise several times, and while you may have been successful in the short term, your problem is maintaining that weight loss. Every time you lose, you eventually shoot back up again. You may have also tried prescription medications. While many individuals do lose weight, the average weight loss from prescription medication is approximately 18 pounds. When you eat, you put food in your mouth where it is chewed and swallowed down your esophagus into your stomach. Currently, your stomach can hold about 40 ounces of food. Once in your stomach, food combines with digestive juices containing acids and enzymes that help break it down into small particles. The next step in digestion involves the small intestine. Your small intestine is about 20 feet in length, about the length of a tennis court. The first 12 inches of your small intestine is called the duodenum. The next 8 feet, or middle section of the small intestine, is called the jejunum. The last section is called the ileum. After food is broken down in the stomach, the small particles are released into your duodenum by a muscle called the pyloric valve. Your pyloric valve is a ring of muscle between your stomach and duodenum. Your pyloric valve slowly releases the food particles in small amounts into the duodenum. Once in your duodenum, enzymes from your liver and pancreas mix with the small particles to help break them down even more. After this point, nutrients from the particles are absorbed in malabsorptive, restrictive, and combination malabsorptive restrictive procedures. Malabsorptive type surgeries were the first kind of weight loss procedures and began in the 1950s. In malabsorptive procedures, weight loss happens by shortening the part of the small intestine that absorbs the most calories. This category of procedures is the least commonly performed. Restrictive type procedures were first introduced in the 1980s. In restrictive procedures, Weight loss is achieved by making the stomach smaller. In restrictive procedures, there is no shortening or reshaping of the intestines. Weight loss happens because you eat less food. Combination malabsorptive restrictive type procedures have been developing since the 1960s. In combination malabsorptive restrictive procedures, weight loss happens by...